Hi there. We'll be talking about immutable infrastructure using Jenkins. We're from Big Panda, which is an uh, algorithmic event management platform. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're a Node.js and Scala shop, but not only. We also have Python and Golang and other technologies. And we use a lot, a lot of microservices. So that really makes our CI pipeline complex. We really, really love Jenkins. We've been fortunate enough not, on, not only to contribute code to Jenkins, but the Big Panda Jenkins plugin was actually the 1,000th uh, Jenkins plugin. And Koiski was so awesome, not only noticing this, but he sent us this 3D printed Jenkins logo, which is still under my monitor today. Uh, so that was Big Panda. And for us too, this is Noah Kurman. Uh, Noah Hi. is our CI guild leader. She's our most famous uh, DevOps engineer. Uh, you might have heard her uh, lecturing about Ansible in our Ansible meetup and other meetups as well. And this is Eric Zadi. Eric is a team leader in Big Panda, and he's also our community ambassador, which basically means he deals with all the conferences and all the meetups in Big Panda. And also, of course, he's our biggest uh, problem solver and maker. So uh, once upon a time, we had a CI environment, obviously based on Jenkins, that kind of worked. Uh, we had tests running on Jenkins slaves. Each uh, Jenkins slave was pre-installed with whatever infrastructure we needed to run the test. That could be the runtime, like JVM or Node.js. That could be the components we used in the tests, like MongoDB for database, RabbitMQ for queue system, and so on and so on. And everything worked perfectly. We lived happily ever after. Uh, the developers were happy. We were happy. Everything, the test ran. Uh, the services uh, worked perfectly. Uh, except uh, one Thursday night, uh, everything bad always happens on a Thursday night, uh, the test started to fail. So we just ran them again until they worked. And then they kept failing. So running again didn't help. We actually had to debug. And to debug, we have to SSH to the actual slaves. And we noticed we have a problem with disk space. So we thought, let's optimize. Let's create a cron tab that deletes temp files all the time. And then something weird started to happen. Uh, tests from the same service started to interrupt each other while running uh, simult simultaneously. So we used the Jenkins resource plugin to lock that service as a resource. And then, so we will only run one test each time for each service. So if we had several branches being pushed, they would wait so just one test would run at a time. And then we went back to sleep. Everything worked perfectly, uh, except it didn't. Suddenly, we started to have uh, invalid databases, which means the databases were corrupted from previous test runs. So whenever we detected that, it was just a pain in the ass. We couldn't really fix that. We just reinstalled the database altogether. And the same thing happened with the queues. So we reinstalled RabbitMQ altogether. And then a parallel test from different services uh, started to interrupt each other while running in the same time. Here we got super creative. We had like five vines of bash in the start of each uh, test, which would scan whatever ports that test would need. And if there's any processes doing, uh, having those ports open, we would kill Windows 9 them all. And of course, nothing is complete without RAM problems. So we seriously thought about stop using JVM apps altogether. Uh, as you might see, we had a lot of problems. This was not debuggable at all. Uh, to debug this, we had to manually SSH into the Jenkins slaves. And whenever somebody manually SSHs, it leaves manual residue. That means that the tests are dirty. They might have been working, they might have not. And that might be due to that uh, manual intervention. Uh, we kept chasing our tails all the time, trying to patch and fix this environment to be uh, stable. Uh, and this took so much time and effort from our team all the time. Uh, we really suffered from waiting times. We could wait up to 45 minutes to just get a build, uh, both because the fact that we locked, as we explained before, the per service had a lot of waiting times. And then we tried to optimize things. So in the beginning of each build, we have so many things running to keep everything clean. And at the end of the build, we also had a lot of cleanup things that were supposed to make the next uh, uh, test have some kind of random t chance to actually succeed. Uh, but the main, main problem we had was, of course, that developers were frustrated because of this. 
Uh, it was unpredictable, it wasn't stable at all, and that means that the developers, when they were ever pushing code, they couldn't be certain that if the tests fail or not, that could be an indication whether if they could uh, push that to production or not afterwards. So we had to think of a solution, and we found something called immutable inf infrastructure. Uh, immutable infrastructure is built around the concept of idempotency. Idempotency, other than just being a really hard word to pronounce, uh, it's the idea of running the same input on the same function will always give me the same output. Simply put, if I, wanna, if I put the same input, I get the same output. So how does immutable infrastructure use this concept? It uses it uh, as the infrastructure is the function we spoke about. So the infrastructure always has to be the same for each input, so we'll get the same output. So that means we need always to have fresh DBs, fresh queues, fresh file system, fresh everything. And all of this has to be isolated. Uh, it has to be isolated, so the input won't be uh, interrupted by anything but other than the infrastructure we are running on. And all of this comes to replacing all the components instead of changing them at each run. So this sounds amazing, right? This sounds something that should be just on by default in Jenkins, or just some kind of checkbox we could even mark to make this so. But that's not it, because it's, it's not really that easy. You would also think that one of the Trezillion Jenkins plugins that are out there could do this for us. But again, it's not like that, because it's hard. You have to custom ta list, uh, tailor this uh, to your infrastructure need, to whatever versions of databases you're using, or special properties that your queue system is using. And it's just not mm, a, a possible to have just one generic solution. So you're probably thinking, OK, we could outsource this to CircleCI, Travis, and some other cloud services and names I really shouldn't mention in this conference. Uh, and uh, truth to be told, we tried doing this with Travis, uh, which is supposed to be their like, forte. But uh, in the end, we stopped using Travis, and we, we went with Jenkins. But we couldn't get the granular level of control that we get in Jenkins. We couldn't control the versioning, the exact thing that are going on within the build. And Jenkins allows us to do that. So we had to think about how can we do it. Uh, and we are all DevOps, so obviously we decided to go with Bash. Let's just bash the whole thing. Let's just write scripts for everything. Uh, the Bash script would uh, trigger the job and would uh, uh, create the infrastructure and run the test, and that's perfect. More than that, we can do it in a browser. We can use Jenkins uh, Execute Shell uh, a plugin, and we can write all the code inside the browser, and that would be so comfortable, and we can have as many jobs as we'd like. And let's face it, that's really ugly, and that's something we really used. Um, so we decided to uh, think about a better way to do that, because we don't want to rely on bash scripts for everything, and debugging was awful. So uh, we decided to go with uh, J Jenkins uh, Pipeline plugin, as uh, Kasuko uh, talked about in the keynote. Uh, the Pipeline plugin is using Jenkins files. The Jenkins files are written in Groovy. Uh, to which of you who doesn't know, Jenkins, uh, uh, Groovy is a scripting language on uh, JVM. And uh, using the Jen Jenkins file, we can just trigger all the tests and create all the infrastructure. And we can put a Jenkins file inside a, a, every service we have. Every service, in our case, is a, a repository. And this is an example of the Jenkins file we had. And we can put this thing and put place parameters and everything. And uh, this will be in every repository. But as many of you can guess, this is not the best idea to do. Because, for example, in Big Panda, we have around 40 microservices. 40 microservices, meaning 40 repositories. We literally copy-pasted the Jenkins file from one uh, repository to the other. And now, let's say I have a typo. I need to go over 40 repositories, 40 Jenkins files, and fix this typo in each one. This is a huge headache, uh, and it's a total nightmare. So uh, this is also something Koska mentioned in his keynote. We, are start we started using something called the Groovy Shared Library, which is a really great feature. We can have a repo uh, in GitHub uh, with Groovy code. 
And Jenkins looks at that uh, repository and makes that Groovy code available to all the jobs within Jenkins. Uh, this meant that we could start reusing code. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter if we're doing a Node.js job or a Scala job or a Golang or what have you. Uh, we have common steps in all of those, like things mundane things like Git cloning, and uh, that could uh, now be a reusable code that we write in one repo. Uh, other examples are to just update uh, GitHub pull requests and update the build description. You can see that in the example below. Uh, another example is a gathering test result. This is something you would typically do each build. Uh, we have one function to do that, no matter the technology be behind the scenes that run the tests. It's just one tested function that we know that works that gathers it for us, and it's very simple to work with. Uh, another cool thing that you can do, the, the Jenkins file itself, as Noah mentioned before, is a DSL over Groovy. It's not Groovy per se. And uh, when you can create something called a Groovy variable that allows you to take the funky Groovy code you can see on the left side and allow the developer within the Jenkins file to use a very simple, readable DSL that you can see on the right, file, so, uh, right side. So uh, if I'm a developer and I wanted to add a... a um, a Node.js build, all I needed to do was write the Node.js build and the parameters needed. But the absolute best thing about that is that this is code. This is a repository. It's a version control. I can work on this locally on my dev Jenkins iteratively until I succeed at whatever I try to do. I can push this on a feature branch and get a review from my peers about the code before we put this into Jenkins. It's manageable as opposed to something within a tab in a browser, which is not. Uh, another cool feature that you have, you probably are familiar with the rebuild that you can do for each job in Jenkins. Whenever you're working with a Jenkins file, you have a replay option now. And the replay option uh, allows you to actually edit the Jenkins file that you have in your repo uh, just for that build. So you can dynamically add whatever parameters you support uh, in your code. So in this example, we can see we added a clean build on the debug flag. This means that for the next run of this job that we're triggering now, we'll get a lot, a lot of log messages, and the build cache will be deleted before we start to run the job. So uh, all of this is very nice, but uh, the topic of the talk was immutable infrastructure. We haven't talked about that at all. Uh, that's true. Uh, um, we still have the needs, and what, all the niceties that we did before didn't solve this, and the needs we have. Uh, are still clean builds that leave absolutely no leftovers at all. It should be very easy to add new infrastructure, new versions of databases, new versions of queues, new versions of runtimes, etc. Uh, there's a new uh, Node.js runtime every two weeks. Um, and it should be very easy to run multiple steps that uh, test simultaneously and they shouldn't interfere with each other. They should be completely isolated. Uh, it should be fast as hell. You shouldn't wait uh, for long waiting times. It should just work really fast. And it should be easy for the developers to debug problems with their tests later without actually SSHing to the Jenkins slaves. Uh, so we went looking for solutions. And like all the cool kids, we started using Docker. Uh, Docker is cheap on resources. It's really fast to spin up containers. You have Docker images of almost whatever you want in, within Docker Hub, so we, it covered almost all our infrastructure needs. Uh, and whatever we needed more than that, we just built our own Docker images. The Jenkins Docker support, as you might have seen in several other talks, is extremely comprehensive. Uh, it, really, it really is uh, debuggable and easy. For instance, uh, you can see that on the bottom here. Uh, it will add a fingerprint of the Docker images uh, IDs that were used in this specific run. So if you have one run and then you updated the Docker images in run and again, you will know what run, ran in each uh, job run. Uh, and the best thing is, of course, that it's programmable using Groovy. That means that we can use our sh Groovy shared library uh, and manage Docker however we want with code. So before we go on to talk about how everything is combined, we should talk about the pitfalls, because nothing is perfect. We had some fun, everything was nice, but we did have some problems along the way. Uh, these problems caused, uh, caused the whole process to be a bit slower, uh, for us to have a, a bit more of a headache after building all of this, and it slowed us down. So what were the problems? First of all, Groovy. Uh, in Big Panda, we didn't use any Groovy uh, when starting to use, it, use the Jenkins pipe, Pipeline plugin. Uh, we didn't want to use any Groovy. We didn't want to know any Groovy. But we had to learn a whole new language just for the CI. 
More than that, we, once we learned Groovy, we understood that the Groovy we, we have in the code area is not exactly the same thing as the Groovy we have in the plugin. So we can elaborate about it later, but there are a few differences between the Groovies, and then we ha had some problems recreating uh, some of the code we already wrote. Uh, the same thing, the, the next thing is the Docker. We did use some Docker in our development, development uh, environment, and we did know some Docker, but nothing was production and nothing was really ready, so we had to do a lot of things from scratch. We needed to create uh, Docker images, both for our infrastructure and our services. We needed to find a way to manage those images and to find a way to control and uh, build all our images. Uh, the next thing is the, the steps we had to debug while creating. So for us, the DevOps, which built the whole process, uh, it was pretty hard to follow uh, the arrows we had while building it. We need to go to Jenkins to find if there was a problem there. We need to go to uh, the plugin. We need to go to our code. We need to go to the Docker. And each one of them had its own problems. And of course, we all know it. Docker has its own problems. Um, for example, it's pretty hard to link between Dockers, and the whole network around Docker is not that easy. So we encountered uh, some problems there, too. But uh, in spite of those pitfalls, uh, we managed to get on. And here's kind of where we are today. Uh, in order for a developer to add needed infrastructure uh, that is immutable to, its, uh, to a new service or an existing service, we need to add one line within our Jenkins file. And that's the needed infra array that you might be able to see. And uh, I, all the developer needs to do is to specify whatever infrastructure he needs. And then he pushes the code to GitHub. Uh, GitHub then notifies Jenkins via, via webhook. That webhook is, by the way, set up automatically by the GitHub organization plugin, which we really recommend. Uh, GitHub then reads the Jenkins file, not, notice that there's Groovy and there's a Groovy shared library, which is ours. And then our code kicks in. So our uh, shared library will spin up uh, all the Docker in, uh, containers needed and specified in the Jenkins file. And then it will spin up an additional container to actually run all the tests and run all the build process and link all those created infrastructure containers to it. That means that on this new test runner, uh, we have Mongo available on port, which is our newly created Mongo container, and only that. So we can run several simultaneously. That shouldn't disturb it. Uh, we finish whatever build process we have. That can be build docs, uh, run tests, build artifacts, what have you. Uh, w when all that is done, Jenkins automatically not only closes the containers, also removes them, so there's no leftovers, no disk space filling up. We then take those, uh, our Groovy shared library uh, uploads whatever artifact we have through S3 and Amazon. Our Groovy shared library also notifies us via Slack. And in Slack, we have this awesome chat off spot, which allows us to deploy directly from Slack. And the way that works is it actually contacts Jenkins, which does the deployment using Ansible as our orchestration to push that to whatever we want, to production staging, whatever we want. And the super cool thing is all of this took 1 minute 21 seconds for one of our more complex projects. And the even better thing is that wh whatever multiple branches uh, of the same project were uh, pushed uh, simultaneously and other projects were running uh, at the same time, it will still take around 1 minute 20 seconds, and that's it. That was super cool. So now the developers are happy, we are happy, and all of this because uh, if you remember the list of problems we had at the start, we solved all of the problems. First of all, it's very easy to debug everything for the developers. All they have to do is to go to the Jenkins console log. They have all the output there, the output from the infrastructure, the output from the test. They can see everything there. And also, they don't even have to go into Jenkins to find out the result of the test. They get it to Slack by a trigger. Uh, the second thing is everything is very predictable. We don't have to be afraid that the test we ran today and has succeeded will fail tomorrow because of infrastructure or because of or of anything that is our fault. Uh, the infrastructure is very, very isolated, uh, meaning we can run multiple services, multiple tests at the same time without them uh, interrupti interrupting each other. Uh, it's very fast, as Eric mentioned. 
and it's easy to use for the developers. They only have to push their code to GitHub, and everything happens automatically, and the tests are built, and the infrastructure and everything. And of course, the infrastructure is finally stable. We don't have to deal every day with uh, disk problems, RAM problems, anything like that. So that's it. And before the question, we'll just say, uh, first of all, obviously, we are hiring as well. And we have swag, 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 swag. swag. We have some <laughs> awesome swag to give up after the question, so stay tuned. Yeah. Thank you. So, any questions? Gam beivrit, tafshar li shol, akol beseder. We can share parts parts of it. We have plans for that. Uh, the question was if we can share in open source, of course, that Groovy shared library. And yes, we have plans for that, and we're going to share as much as we can. Yeah. yeah. How long was the journey? How long was the journey? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, to make it production ready, let's say, it took us uh, around a month or two. But to actually build the whole process and to make it work, uh, it took two days, maybe. Yeah. Two Saturdays at my mother-in-law. Yeah. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question was, uh, how do we deal with uh, database migration or uh, creating new tables or whatever is needed in the database uh, if we need to prepare Docker images with that prepared already? So uh, we work with Mongo, and everything is created once the process is up. So we don't have those problems specifically. But good question. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, sorry? Could you? GitHub component version? Oh, different infra component ah, different versions. Component. So, so the question was, how do we question. handle the different infrastructure component versions? Say that uh, one specific uh, uh, service requires Kafka with a certain version, and another service requires Kafka with a second version. So the, the simple uh, uh, line that you saw that I just need Mongo, that will take the default. There's a convention with just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, uh, with um, semicolon and a version that you need. It's just a, a map that we have to the actual Docker images. So we have, and then you can be more explicit with the specific versions that you need. Awesome. Any more? How did it help us to isolate the tests? You can run multiple tests at the same time now. Uh, so let's say. Let's just uh, repeat the question. Oh, sorry. sorry. So the question was uh, how the isolation of the tests and of. No? So uh, the, the question was, uh, he, he asked if we uh, install several versions of uh, MongoDB, how do we know which one to go? We don't install. We spin up a Docker container with a specific Mongo version, and only that Docker container is linked to the test runner. So we can have several Docker containers with several different Mongo versions. Yeah. No, each it's service per, has... Per has a parameter for the Docker for the Docker or Mongo con uh, a version they want to use. Okay, uh, so I think it's time for swag. Thank you all, and if you want, we have some cool big panda swag over here. Yeah. Thank you.